and welcome to First Wesleyan Church. We are glad that you are here this morning. Please stand with us. We're going to begin our service this morning with praise and worship. From this heart, open wide, from the depths, from the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice. I will bring a sacrifice. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. Whoa, and all my heart, this much is true. There's no life of Life and let it shine. Take this life and let it shine. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. Whoa, and on my heart, this much is true. My joy to say your will, your way, it will be my joy to say your will, your way, it will be my joy to say your will, your way, always. It will be my joy to say. Your will, your way, it will be my joy to say. Your will, your way, it will be my joy to say. Your will, your way, always. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Thanks for joining us here to worship our God this morning. You may be seated. Well, good morning to each of you. I'm glad that you're here this morning. If you didn't happen to get a flyer on your way in, they're out on the high top tables out in the commons area. Feel free to even slip out now if you'd like and, and grab one. Um, I would do want to make reference to the attendance record and the chair rack near you. If you do, please take one of those out at this point in time and place it in the offering plate as you go out and put it, uh, have the required information. That would be great. To help us know that you're here in our service today. If you're a first-time guest, take this and drop it off at the information desk. We have a special gift for you. If you're viewing online, text me 605-430-3019. Let us know that you're in attendance. We are able to give away money, and one of the ways that we've been able to give away money is going to be represented on a video on the screen behind me to a place called e Swatini. So please watch this video. Greetings again. Uh, my name is Joshua Azikiwe. I'm the current principal of Emmanuel Wesleyan Bible College, situated in Manzini, 
here in Eswatini, which was formerly known as Swaziland, on the Southern Africa region of our great continent. As we speak, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary, meaning that we've existed for 50 years now. And uh, as a leadership of this institution, we decided to begin a journey of not only modernizing our institution, but refurbishing whatever we can. And um, it has taken partners like you to stand with us in a journey like this. And therefore, on the 9th of May, I began my journey to South Africa uh, to begin to shop around for some technical equipment, some computer equipment. And uh, I was hosted at Wesley Seminary in Brackpan, Johannesburg. And with the help of Dr. Galela, uh, everything uh, worked out very smoothly. Apparently, Dr. Galela was the one shepherding me in and about uh, the streets of South Africa as we were looking for shops to purchase. Unfortunately, we were not allowed to film any, 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 any of the shops as we were buying whatever we were buying. Uh, due to serious security reasons uh, that are currently prevailing in Johannesburg. And therefore, apologies that you're not able to get uh, any of those uh, you know, shopping uh, experiences. Although I tried to capture one or two things, but uh, it really didn't work out uh, so well. However, we managed to get a server cabinet, uh, which is a 20, uh, technical people will call it a 27U uh, cabinet, we were able to get network cables, we were able to get uh, a switch, that is a 24-port switch, and we managed to buy a 3KVA uh, UPS, which we've all mounted as we speak, and are ready to operate. In a month's time, uh, our developers will migrate uh, our newly bought software from India uh, into our local server here at EWBC. And as you may know, uh, our reason for really setting up this server was because of the in, in unstable internet connectivity and a lot of downtime that we experience on this side of the world. And therefore having a, so a local server would allow us to operate even if the internet is down. And therefore on, the on, on behalf of the Board of Management, uh, whose chair is the National Superintendent of the Wesleyan Church in Eswatini, uh, that is Reverend Tapsile Tuala, and the Staff Council of EWBC. We truly appreciate uh, First Wesleyan Church in Rapid City, South Dakota, for, for gifting us this gift of a server. May the good Lord bless you, because this will go a long way in improving both our administrative and academic functions of the school. Thank you very much and God bless you. <clears throat> we have such great internet connection and boy, if we need something, we can just go down to Best Buy and get it. And yet... Uh, we were able to help give some money for this Bible school to have uh, some great help with their server and computer uh, access. So thank you for giving unto the Lord. That's a, a wonderful thing that you have done. I do want to make reference uh, out on the uh, out on the wall back in here is uh, outside the sanctuary is some new missions posters, and so we have some new missionaries that we're supporting. And so please take a look at those as you leave today. Our vacation Bible school is happening this week. And if you haven't registered your child yet, please do. If you want to invite somebody, there's some postcards available. If you uh, haven't registered yet, then register your child right there. It'll tell you everything. Tomorrow night is a time of decoration uh, from at 7 o'clock. If you haven't done anything in the process, but you'd like to come help decorate, show up at 7. Many hands make light work, and it would be a wonderful thing to help out. At 5.30 on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, there is a family supper, and then programming begins at 6. And so if you want to come to the supper, feel free to do that. 
Our mid-high camp starts tomorrow, and so if you're a middle schooler, please be at Dairy Queen at 2 o'clock, and you'll get some ice cream and then go on up to the camp. Uh, Davin Copton, he's not mentioned in the bulletin, but Davin's sitting right over here. He's actually going to counsel this week, and so you might want to be praying for our mid-high campers. We're going to pray for them in our service, but they're also mentioned on the flyer. If you would pray for them, camp is important. As well as if you have a kid who, who is wanting to go to kids' camp, that's not till July, but registrations are due here June 14th, so please take note of that. A week from today is Father's Day. And we have a Father's Day outreach happening. Several of you are familiar that we've done some flowers in the neighborhood for our Mother's Day outreach. Well, this Saturday, we're doing a Father's Day outreach. And uh, what's going to be given out is some beef jerky and some other flyers about our church. If you would like to be a part of this, of ministering to our neighborhood here and handing these out, show up at 9 o'clock on Saturday This Saturday, June 17, in preparation for Father's Day. And who knows who might come from the neighborhood who needs a good church home. And maybe you can help out in that way this coming Saturday. If you have any questions about that, you can see Pastor Mark, and he can give you more information. Now I will pass it over to Pastor Bradley, who is going to lead us in some singing, I believe. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Thanks again for being here this morning. I know uh, most every Sunday morning you probably hear that, hey, thanks for being here. Hey, we're glad you're here. But really, we are thankful that you are here, and we are glad that you have chosen to come worship the one true living God here at First Wesleyan Church. Maybe you're joining us online, or maybe you're here in person. We're thankful that you've chosen to do that, because you could really be anywhere else that you wanted to be if you wanted to be. You could be vacationing, you could be uh, choosing to sleep in, you could be doing a lot of other things, but yet you have chosen to set apart time in your schedule on this Sunday, this holy day, to give God thanks. So thanks for doing that. And as we continue in a time of worship this morning, I want to encourage us to continue to turn our eyes upon Jesus, to continue to focus on Him. And I pray that as we do that, the Spirit of our Lord would greatly minister to each of your souls here today. There's a great hymn titled, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Many of you are probably familiar with that. And this morning, I want to I introduce a new song to you. It actually has some of the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, in it. But then, what I really appreciate about this song is that it looks forward to the hope. As Christ's followers, we have the hope of heaven. Because we have surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ, we trust in Him, we have the hope of heaven. Let me read Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How's your race going? Looking to Jesus. It doesn't say looking to the world. It doesn't say looking to the next self-help book or social media or your neighbor or politics. No, it says looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, for God so loved the whole world that he gave his one and only son, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 4 of this new song reads, Turn your eyes to the heavens. Our King will return for his own. Every knee will bow, every tongue will shout, all glory to Jesus alone. I'm not sure uh, what you're going through this morning, but may you turn your eyes to Jesus. May you look forward to the hope of heaven. This world is not our home. Heaven is. And so as we continue to worship this morning, may we turn our eyes to Him. 
I'm just going to sing the chorus for you. Feel free to listen, sing along. The words will be on the screen behind me. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Let's sing that together. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes. Let's stand together and continue turning our eyes to our Lord Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful
is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the same.
everything. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. Psalm 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. As we come to a time of prayer, will you bow your heads with me? Prepare your hearts as we, be go, as we go to the Lord of Lord and King of Kings in prayer. The altars are open to anyone that would like to come up during this time. Almighty God, you are the one who blesses. You are the God who enables us to walk in your ways. Right here, right now, God, we have been singing about surrendering completely to you. And so, God, we acknowledge you as our great king. We acknowledge you as Lord. We acknowledge you as the one true God who deserves nothing but our utmost devotion and service. Our entire life, our entire heart, soul, might, and strength is to you and you alone. So God, right here in this moment, in the quietness of this moment, we surrender to you. And we're thankful, God, that you are a God that cares, that you are a God that looked upon us and did not give up, but that you sent your one and only Son who came, who lived, who died, who rose again and ascended to your right hand and now intercedes for us. So we come in the name of Jesus right now and ask that you would forgive us of our sins and that we would follow in your ways, that you, O oh God, would instill in us a fear of the Lord and that we would walk in your ways. Lord, there is a number of things happening this week, and we pray for those who are going to mid-high camp starting tomorrow, Lord. And I pray for Elijah Bender, Elijah Compton, Tyler Dickerson, Samuel McPherson, Ella Mickle, Oscar Olson, Ezra Woolman, and Davin Compton. Lord, I pray for these individuals as they go to mid-high camp that you would Establish a week of fun in their life, but more importantly, a chance to grow deeper in our relationship with you. I pray that when they come back from camp, Lord, that they would be changed even more different than they are now, Lord, and that they would continue to follow you, that you would grow each one's relationship with you stronger and stronger. And Lord, I think of VBS that will be happening this week. And Lord, we pray for each child that comes through these doors, Lord, whether they attend here or they're from the community, God, that they would sense your mighty presence in their life, that they would have an encounter with the living God, and that they would trust in you, whether that's been something they've been doing or for the very first time. I pray for all volunteers, God, that you give them strength and wisdom throughout the week. Thank you for their service to bring your kingdom to come. Lord, I also think of our sister church, River Tree in Mitchell, South Dakota, and Pastor Dan Zebarth. Continue to provide direction for them. Be with Pastor Dan. Restore him. Renew him. Continue to give him guidance as they impact the Mitchell community for the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for Casey and Kendra Culver and their mission to Central Europe. God, I pray, as they bring the good news, that you would bless their path, that you would 
give them strength to speak the gospel, give them boldness when it, the opportunity arises, and that you would protect them, O oh God. I pray for a blessing upon Casey, Kendra, JD, and Anna. Thank you for the Culver family. And I pray for everyone that came in here today within the sound of my voice, that can hear my voice, that you would remind them of your presence. We felt it here this morning, and that you would continue to work in and through each one of us, showing us the path that we need to take, that we may walk in the way everlasting. God, your word is a lamp to our feet. And I pray as Pastor Steve delivers the word this morning, that it illuminate our path and what we should do from what we are about to hear. God, we love you, and we pray all these things in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Mark, for leading us to the Lord in prayer. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them to Deuteronomy chapter 27. If you didn't happen to bring a Bible with you, there's one in the chair rack near you, and it's on page 168. The title of the message is The Stones. Now, um, last week, if you were here, we had some fruit up front, and uh, I had chatted with my kids about that before the service, and they were a little concerned. Uh, yeah, sometimes I throw things to the audience, and they were concerned that I was going to throw the fruit uh, to you and, you know... Watch out for the watermelon, here it comes kind of deal, and that didn't happen. But I hope you enjoyed the fruit uh, last week if you got a watermelon or a pineapple or an apple or whatever it was. Uh, up front today are some stones, uh, and you might be able to take one of those home with you today if you'd like. Um, I'm not going to throw those out as well, so please don't worry about that. Moses is instructed by God to instruct the Israelites to set up some large stones. That's the text for today. And as we look at that, you may think, well, that seems kind of weird. I mean, why are you going to set up a large stone? But as I thought of that, I thought, we kind of do this, but we don't necessarily use stones per se. Um, well, the way that I see that is several of you have been able to go on vacation, and at times when you go on vacation, you bring home a keepsake. There was somebody who was visiting Rapid City here recently, and she wanted to have a special rock from this area to take home with her. Okay, so she could have a special rock. Or maybe for you, you could get a t-shirt. And yeah, I've been to Washington, D.C., look at my t-shirt. Or maybe for you, you get a magnet, or you get a wind chime, or you get a salt and pepper shaker. Got to have a salt and pepper shaker from the state of Idaho because everybody needs a salt and pepper shaker from there. Or maybe you remember getting a stuffed animal somewhere as a younger child, or maybe not so long ago, uh, you got a stuffed animal. Then we also have occasions that we set things up to highlight a marking of what has happened. Maybe for you, you've carved your initials in something. And maybe if you were to take me somewhere in the hills, there on that tree was your initials carved to somebody that you fell in love with. And maybe that person's in your life or not. I don't know anymore. Uh, but your initials, you carved something. Or maybe you placed a flag somewhere. Or maybe you put flowers in a specific place. The Israelites are instructed to set up an altar as a reminder. And maybe this needs to happen in your life today. I call these spiritual markers. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. It's not new to me, but that's what I refer to, Matt. Well, there's something about having a marker of your life of when you have accepted Christ, when, when you became a believer. Some of you have a specific date. I think it's valuable to have a specific time frame or a date for you so you can have it as a spiritual marker. You can go back to and say, I know on that day this is what happened. But then after we accept Christ, there are several things that happen in our lives that serve as spiritual markers. You go to camp and God speaks to you at camp and you're like, yep, that's a spiritual marker for me. You have some kind of a surgery or some kind of physical woe. 
that really drew you close, closer to say, am I going to trust in this almighty being called God, or am I going to turn back on Him? And you have a spiritual marker of some kind, something to show of what God has done and be reminded of. And so as you look back on things and you get discouraged or you get sideways or we just need a reminder, we can see what God has done in our lives like a piece of memorabilia does for you. And so today, I ask the question, what stones are you needing in your life, or what stone? If you join me in God's Word, Deuteronomy chapter 27, I'm going to start at verse 1, and I'm going to go through verse 8. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment that I command you today. And on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster. And you shall write on them all the words of this law when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord the God of your fathers has promised you. And when you have crossed over the Jordan... You shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster, and you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones, and you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God, and you shall sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God." And you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. The first thing I want you to see from the text is this. Leaders were instructed. Moses, if you see it here in verse 1, now Moses and the elders of Israel. I think this is a key point because we need the Moseses in the world, but we also need the elders in the world. We need the leaders in the world. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're a leader of a Christian community, you are an elder. Now, I know there's some churches that have elders and have deacons and and they have specific roles, and I'm fine with that. But here the elders of Israel said, here's what we need to do. It wasn't just Moses. It was Moses and the elders. You you need to be very careful here to, to know that it's not just one person, but it's many people. And what did these people do? This group of Moses and the elders, what did they do? They did this. They were commanded to tell the people, keep the whole commandment that I command you today. That was what they were required to do. I wonder if you're one of these. If you're one of these individuals who are willing, who are saying, we need to keep the commandments. We need to be ones that keep God's holy law. In this day and age where we try to throw out the God's holy law, you be the one, not just a Moses, not just a pastor, but an elder say, no, we need to keep the whole commandments. This is valuable. We need people that speak this to us. Don't shy away. Be strong in these days of ridicule and confusion and debate. We need to stick to the Bible. Why? Because it's God's holy word. Now, several of you do a a wonderful job of keeping the commands with your family. You might have said this to some of your kids. If 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 you have kids, you probably told them, flush the toilet. Now, that's not a biblical command, But that's what you command them to do. Why? Because you want them to flush the toilet. It's hard in this day and age, by the way, because we have electronic toilets. We have electronic um, soap dispensers. We have electronic uh, hand hand dryer things. I mean, why would a kid ever want to flush the toilet? You don't need to do that. You don't need to. You don't need to turn the faucet on. You just stick your hand there. And so, but you have to command them. You have to instruct them in that way. You are one. If you're a parent, you say, now, if you climb that tree, uh, be careful, because if you step on a small branch, you could fall down and hurt yourself. Um, Some of you were instructed by your parents to be careful climbing trees, and you had to learn the hard way. You didn't listen to your parents very well. Maybe you have a kid like that, too, in your home. Uh, You said, don't talk to strangers. You said, say please and thank you. 
If it weren't for instruction, where would we be? These leaders were told to tell others to say, keep the whole commandment. Not just some of it. Keep the whole commandment. If you look in the ESV, you may have a different version, but if you look in the ESV of what I use and what's in the chair rack, you will notice that there are several you shalls in this passage. Actually, there's 12 of them. You shall. Um, I include the one in verse 7, but if you look at all, if you underline them, you shall, you shall, you shall, you shall, you shall. Kind of reminded me of the thou shalts. Maybe you grew up with the King James Version, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Remember some of those thou shalt, the Ten Commandments? He's saying, you shall do this. You shall do this. You shall go ahead and make this happen. And I want you to also notice, notice it's not just Moses, lest it was just made about this soon-to-be-dying man. We've worked through Deuteronomy. We're not all the way done yet. But in Deuteronomy chapter 27, here he is. But what happens in Joshua 1? He dies, okay? <laughs> he, he goes on. But it's not just about, Deut- it's not just about Moses. It's about all of Israel. And they're saying Moses and the elders of Israel. There is something about having those in leadership to help cast vision, give support, and help with those things. But you also need those that, that not just the leader, but others as well. The joint leadership was significant. The people we surround and the people we are surrounded by are significant and important. I encourage you to be a leader. The second thing is God promises again. They were going to cross into the promised land. Crossover is mentioned in verses 2, mentioned in verse 3, mentioned in verse 4. What a promise. Three times in three verses, he says, I am going to help you cross over. Now, in today's age, those words of cross over um, are mentioned when it comes to orientation of some, and that's not what we're talking about at all, okay? We're talking about crossing over from, from this side to the Jordan onto the promised land, and so this is very important. What is God reminding you of today, His faithfulness and how He will lead you? Trust in His promises once again. Number three, they were to set up large stones, Now, each of us might debate, and we don't know exactly how large these stones were. Were they the size size of Mount Rushmore, 60 feet? Were they 12 feet tall? Were they 3 feet tall? What is large? Crazy horse, you might know this. If you participated in the Volksmark a weekend or two ago, um, it's 87 feet tall. Uh, tall is how, how big the face of Crazy Horse is. We're unsure, but obviously it was large enough to be out and to be seen. Now, several years ago, actually in 2013, so 10 years ago now, before this church building was here, we had a church service and we gathered some men and we gathered some rocks and we made an altar. Maybe you remember that. I have some pictures on the screen behind me, but here is one of the rocks that we had. Uh, some of you might be, well, where are those rocks? Um, those rocks are actually now in the uh, circle as you come into the Come into the church parking lot. There are 12 rocks. Don't take this rock, please, because it's going to go back out in front after this service. But we placed those out there. And then we made an altar. And we prayed and said, okay, God, help us as we continue in this endeavor to have a church building here. I also have a picture of some of the kids uh, in our church at that point in time. And Hudson will leave it on the screen here for a little bit. But our kids have grown a a little bit uh, since that point in time. Now, they didn't have cameras back in Deuteronomy. We do, and so we can even, in this way, look back and see and say, hey, remember that. Maybe this is why the rocks were very important, why they were large, so they could look back and remember. Not only were the rocks important, but this place that they were at was important. Eugene Merrow um, sees this as a significant place, and I, I think God uses places. Though Deuteronomy chapter 27 doesn't say Shechem exactly, it does talk about Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, and this, and this area here is also a place around Shechem. Now, why is this important? Well, if you look in Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, Abram was appeared to by God at Shechem. 
And in Genesis chapter 33, verses 19 and 20, you will see that Jacob purchased a property and dug a well at Shechem. Joshua then led a covenant renewal ceremony at Shechem after entering the promised land. You'll see that in Joshua 24. Why is this important? Because not only does God use large rocks, He also uses the place. There are places in our lives that stick out to us. There are some of you in this room that if I say the word of family ranch, that's significant to you. Others of you, there's no significance whatsoever. But if I say, where's the family ranch? Now, I may not be able to find it because I may not be able to find the third hawk sitting on the pole next to the red barn and turn at that last big rock down at the end of the gravel road. I couldn't find that. Some of you would know. But that was a significant place for you. Places are important. Church buildings. You may remember a church building that you were at specifically where God spoke to you about something. And if I was to ask you, what about that church building? You might remember a concrete floor. You might remember a hard pew. You might remember that it was very hot. You may not remember the speaker. You might remember the speaker who was up front, and you remember him speaking and how important that was. Places in creation speak to you. God continues to say, remember not only in word, but in location as well. A wedding. If you're married in the room, if I ask you where you got married, Several of you would know. Some of you have forgotten. And huh, I can't remember. Uh, our camp is valuable. And uh, so kids are going to camp. And that's a valuable place where God meets with some individuals. So years down the road, some young child or maybe even you will say, I made a commitment to the Lord in this building. Maybe on, even on this day, June, chapter, June 11 of 2023. 20, this is the place that the stones would go. Think on these rock structures. Some of you have been to some of these rock structure places. One of those, if you haven't been to this one, you need to get there. It's right close here. But Mount Rushmore is a rock structure. Stone Mountain in Atlanta is a rock structure. Chimney Rock in Nebraska, that may not be very important to you, but as they were traveling across, many of our ancestors were traveling across the state of Nebraska, that served as a great marker for them. Cathedral Rock in Sedona, Arizona. Many of you have been privileged to walk around Devil's Tower Landscape Arch in Utah. Has anybody ever been to the Natural Bridge in Virginia? Anybody ever been to the Natural Bridge in Virginia? Well, you should go there sometime. It's a natural bridge. It's kind of neat. Stonehenge in England. I don't know if you've been to that, but several of you have been to Carhenge, but that's a little different different place, uh, of course. Um, the next place, Casa Catui Tent Rocks in New Mexico. That's kind of a neat little deal there. Garden of the Gods in Colorado. I'm assuming many of you have been to Garden of the Gods in Colorado. Rocks that if you've been there, you remember being there, and wow, the beauty of God's creation. That wasn't done by evolution by any means. God created that, and that might have happened after the flood. I'm not sure exactly, but God did that. All these places are specific rock places. These stones in this place would serve as a reminder for years to come. These stones were a reminder to talk about God's love. Think on this. There would be some who would be born after these stones were going to be put in place. And they would say, what are these large stones for? What do they mean? What, what's the significance of these? Why is that stone there? Well, let me tell you, son. <laughs> Our ancestors many years ago were in Egypt, and we were slaves in Egypt. And you know what God did? He brought us out by His mighty hand. And then we wandered for a while. Uh, we had a little difficulty at one point in time. Some spies went into the land, and they were worried about grasshoppers and, and grapes, and uh, they were worried about all kinds of things. But, and so we had to wander for a while. But then something happened. God led us through, and he led us through the Jordan. And you know where? We're now in the promised land. You may think these are the bad old days, but these aren't the bad old days. These are the good old days. The bad old days were back then. The good old days 
are now. See, God uses places and he uses rocks. And Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone. If you turn towards the back of the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 2. Might be a, might be a piece of scripture you'd like to uh, commit to memory and you might want to look at. Here's what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by, by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but not for those who do not believe. Ephesians chapter 2 says it this way, so you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Just as God asked the Israelites to set up these large stones, I ask that you have Jesus as your chief cornerstone. If he is yours already, depend on him as the rock. I'm reminded of these songs. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is is sinking sand. The fourth thing is this. They were to write on the stones. We are unsure of what they wrote exactly on the stones. Was it all of Deuteronomy? Um, all the Ten Commandments? Somehow they knew what to write. Several would say this. Several would say that they wrote from what was Deuteronomy, from Deuteronomy chapter 12 through Deuteronomy chapter 26. Now, this is different from 2023 because if we would have it today, what we would do is we would put the uh, writings on a flash drive and then we'd put them into the computer and then we'd display them on the screen. But they didn't do that then. What they did was they wrote them on this rock. And if you see in, verse, in chapter 27, verse 8, it says, And you shall write on the stones of all the words of this law very plainly. Quite honestly, some of you wouldn't have been uh, charged for this task because, well, what did that person write? Because some of your penmanship isn't all that good. Now, others of you, you'd be like, ah, that person write it because we'll be able to see and we'll be able to know what it is. Talk about plaster, and they were given instructions in that way. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 and 21 says, My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always, tie them around your neck. Now, writing on stones was somewhat common. I have a picture of a rock from ancient, ancient age. Anybody know what this rock is? It is the code of Hammurabi. All right, maybe you've heard of that. Maybe you haven't. 1795 to 1750 B.C. It was a set of 282 laws. The code of Hammurabi, if you look it up online, is over seven foot tall. And so it was a large stone. It contained 8,000 words. And the code is twice as long as Deuteronomy chapter, um, Deuteronomy, if it was Deuteronomy 12 to 26, it was twice as long. Did they end up doing this? Did they end up putting this on? Yes, they did. If you go ahead to Joshua chapter 8 and you look at verse 32, after they cross into the promised land, here's what it says in Joshua 8, 32. And there in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. One commentator says it this way. The publication of law implies the proclamation of it as the law of the land where it is public. The public inscription of God's covenant with Israel at the moment of her arrival in Canaan would signify the nation's acceptance of it as the rule of her life in the new land. So basically, here it is. We're in the new land. Here's what we agree to. This is what we go by. There's been other writings that we deem important. Maybe you know some of these. The Mayflower Compact, 
the Declaration of Independence. Ever heard that? It's a writing. It wasn't on a rock. Emancipation Proclamation, the Treaty of Versailles, the Magna Carta. Writings were important. There's something about having something in writing. And here it was to be on large rocks for all to see and listen and abide by. The Word of God, says one commentator, needs not to be set off by the art of man nor embellished with the enticing words of man's wisdom. The Word of God needs not to be set off by the art of man nor embellished with the enticing words of man's wisdom. There wasn't something fancy painted on behind the rock. Now, maybe you want that you like to paint rocks. Fine, that's fine. But these large rocks, there was, oh, that's a beautiful scene behind the law that's put on that rock. No, it was the law. And it wasn't anything that man would include. Oh, man, Steve, if you could add some commentary to that, that would be great. You add your little two cents. No, it wasn't that at all. It was the laws of God that were put there. Proverbs chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. The fifth thing I want you to see is this. They were to build an altar. Now, many altars were built in the Old Testament. We continue to have altars at our church. And it represents something to people, and we can worship God there. Here's what one has said. The word and prayer must go together. The word and prayer must go together. What does that mean? The word on the rocks and prayer, worship of Almighty God, must go together. The altar was to be of uncut stones. There, there's speculation of why that was, but maybe to not decline the correct structure of God. They were to be in their natural state, so maybe a chisel would pollute them. But if you look back in Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20 verse 25 kind of actually tells us about it. It says this, if you make an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hone stones, for it, if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. And so again, uh, they said, okay, let's do that. So did they do this? They sure did. Go ahead again to Joshua chapter 8, and you look at verse 30, and it says this, At that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal. And do you see what they were supposed to do at the altar? Here's what it says in verse 7. After they built the altar in verse 6, and then in verse 7 it says this, And you shall sacrifice peace offerings, and shall eat there, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. What are they to do? Sacrifice peace offerings. I want to encourage you to do this. Are you willing this week to sacrifice a peace offering with someone? Maybe it's someone in church. Sometimes us in the church, we get kind of riled up about some things, and then we get frustrated with somebody else in the church because they don't agree with us. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. And we get pretty, our feathers can get rougher, ruffled pretty quickly. And they were to offer peace offerings. And I encourage you, be one to offer peace offerings to others in the church are outside of the church. Even people that ridicule, make fun of, and condemn you. You offer peace offerings. Maybe you were offended by someone in recent days. Be willing to do as the Scripture says and go and offer a peace offering. Is that easy to do? <laughs> Pretty much. No, it's not. It's not easy to do. Because I'm in the right, and they're not. But this is what they're supposed to do. Offer peace offerings. Sacrifice peace offerings. That's a good word. You need to sacrifice your own will. And you shall eat there. And then also what should happen? You shall rejoice. Continue to come to the specific place and be reminded of God's workings and build an altar and offer peace. So what is God calling you today? Maybe God is asking you to keep His commands Maybe he's asking you to set up some kind of a stone on this day to use as a spiritual marker. Maybe you will rely on God as the chief cornerstone and trust in God today. Maybe 
you will offer to God your sacrifice. Trust in Him today. Look back on this day as Him as a rock of deliverance. The physical rock does not save you, but it points to the rock of Jesus Christ. Another song, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. If you look in 1 Samuel chapter 7, there's a, a situation going on with Samuel and the Israelites and the Philistines. What's going on is there's a battle going on. But the Israelites were able to pursue and uh, struck them, as verse 11 says. And then Samuel says this in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, till now the Lord has helped us. That's what, the, that's what that name means, Ebenezer. Till now the Lord has helped us. And verse 13, so the Israelites were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. What does that mean exactly? I think God uses rocks, whether it be large rocks or um, Samuel set up a, a rock and said, Ebenezer, till now the Lord has helped us. We sing the song, Come Now Fount of Every Blessing. I don't know if you remember that hymn or not, but the second verse says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. <laughs> Sometimes in hymns we just sing the song, Here I raise my Ebenezer. I have no idea what that means. What does that mean? Saying, here, I'm raising my Ebenezer. I am saying that thus far God has helped me. I'm raising a stone. Now again, does that stone save you? No, it doesn't, but it serves as a spiritual marker. Just like your stuffed animal you got from somewhere serves as a marker of some trip you took and you won. Your dad somehow knocked down or got that little hook over the ring somehow. Who knows how it happened because those games are rigged, but he did it and he got a stuffed animal. In the same way, God says, I'd like to move you beyond. So I don't know for you if God has been speaking to you about something, and in these next couple of moments, I'm just going to be praying for you. I have some rocks up front. I have some Sharpie markers up front. And so I just ask you today, is God asking you to cross over or step over in the promised land with something? Maybe he's been dealing with something in your life. And as you leave today, you just want to grab a rock and you don't need to write anything on it at all. But maybe you'd like to write something down on it and say, thus far has God helped me. And you mark down this date as being something very significant for you. You may say, you know what, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm under 18, so what can God do? God can do something. I, I just talked about Samuel. Do you know when he was called by God? When he was just a young boy. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm too old. I, I, uh, do you know how old Moses was at this point in time? Again, he died when he was about 120 if we're towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy chapter 27, he's probably getting close to that. See, God uses spiritual markers, and there's times when God, just in a specific place, even maybe today, God's been speaking to you. Maybe he's asking you to step over in your spiritual life to depend on him. Maybe he's asking you to step over instead of living in fear. Maybe he's asking you to step over in holiness. Maybe he's asking you to step over in discipline. Maybe he's asking you to step over in, in a language. Maybe he's asking you to step over in a habit that you have. And you've just been, well, it's just a habit. No. And God says, no, step over. Cross into the promised land. Maybe you need to step over in a relationship. Maybe you step over in obedience. Whatever it might be for you. You don't have to take a rock today, but maybe for you. It'd be significant for you to say, just like the Israelites when they crossed over the Jordan, they put up a large stone. You're not going to take a large stone home with you. You're not even going to take this one. But maybe you can take one of these, put it somewhere and say, no, that serves as a spiritual marker for me. Maybe in your office. Maybe you put it in your car. Maybe your kids will ask you, Dad, what's that rock for? And you just look at them and you say, thus far the Lord has helped me. Maybe you don't want to go into it because maybe it's too near and dear to your heart. Maybe you don't write anything, but you just put it. Maybe you put it in the front of your house. Maybe you put it by your coffee table. Maybe you put it by your desk, wherever it might be. Maybe it serves as a reminder to you, just like this served as a reminder to the Israelites. Whenever you see the large stones, 
What, is that? what does that large stone mean? Remember how God led us through and how he will be faithful to do his mighty work. Would you stand with me this morning? Would you bow your heads and would you close your eyes? Again, if God is speaking to you, a stone is not a, there's not a magic potion in any of these stones. There was not a magic potion in those large stones, but they served as a spiritual marker and they ministered to the people of Israel. Oh God, I pray for each person here today, each man. I pray for each woman. I pray for each boy. And I pray for each girl. Believe in the power of the Holy Spirit who speaks. Maybe you're speaking to someone today about something in their life and they just need to have a marker of some kind. So after I finish praying, God, I just pray that they would come and grab a rock and take it with them. And then that will serve as a reminder how you have delivered them, how you have saved them, how you have lifted them up, how you have led them. And they say yes to you yet again. And they say yes to you for the very first time. Say on that day, is in that church on June 11, 2023, God did this because God can do these things even today. Maybe there's a young lady here this morning that's been wrestling through something for some time. And she knows what it is. And yet right now she says, okay, <laughs> as the song said, I surrender. I surrender that. I said, give that to the Lord. Maybe there's a man here today who's been stressing, who's been wrestling, who's been mm, <laughs> mad. And yet you say, I still love you. I pray, God, that that person would just know today of your love and your mighty power and that they would say, thus far the Lord has helped me. Oh God, I pray that you would help each of us to keep your whole command each and every day. And may we honor and may we glorify your name. And now God, I pray that as each of these people leave from this sanctuary today, that they would know that your presence goes with them and goes before them and you will be with them each step of the way. May you guard each mind, may you guide each heart, and may we worship and honor you all this week. Thank you for this building. Thank you for this worship time. And I pray that you'd go before reach. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.